Okay, so section five talks about the trigonometric forms of complex numbers. Now, the reason they tie this into vectors is because they have a lot in common with them. Okay? In general, if you have a complex number, that's that A plus BI number, I can actually graph that on what's called a complex plane, where instead of using the XY axis, you actually use the all real numbers as the horizontal axis and all imaginary numbers as the vertical axis. So if I have three plus i, what that means is I'm going to go over three up one. If I have negative two minus i, I'm going to go left two down one. So the, whatever the coefficient on the i, that's your vertical. Whatever the, uh, the constant by itself is, that's your horizontal. What that allows me to do then is to look at it as where that point is in relation to the origin. Okay. Now, if I want to find the distance from the origin out to that point, well, that's just the distance formula. The square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay. Now, we actually end up referring that as to as the radius of the point, how far out it is from the center, from the origin. So if I want to find, well, first off, I want to graph this. How would I graph this on that complex plane? Three to the right, down four. Okay, because this axis is all your real numbers. This axis is all the imaginary numbers. So it would just be this point. What would its absolute value be? Five, because it's literally just the distance from the center, from the origin, out to that point. So I just take a squared plus that b value squared and square root it. So you get five. Okay, now trigonometric form uses this distance out from the center, calls it the radius of the function, or of the complex number, I should say, along with the angle from the x-axis counterclockwise. So this this radius and this angle are actually just what that we've been doing for the past week. So radius, distance out from center. Magnitude and direction. Yes. Your theta value and your radius are just magnitude and direction, done a slightly different way. So what that allows us to do is to manipulate things a little bit. Because that vertical is going to be r sine theta. Whatever your radius is times the sine of theta, that's your vertical. The a, or in other words, the imaginary component. The a, the real component, is just radius times cosine. So what you get is this statement here. A plus bi, that in that complex number form, you can write it in trigonometric form, so you have standard form and trig form, where you just take r times those values, sine and cosine, just realizing that sine is the vertical, cosine is the horizontal. So it's summarized here. And if you want to find those values, it actually makes it pretty simple because radius is just distance formula. What if I need to find theta, though? How would I do that? Well, how did we do? direction when you have a vector that's listed as like 7, 8. Inverse tangent. Tangent theta is equal to that rise over run, the vertical over horizontal, and then just inverse tangent. So it's the same stuff we've been doing, just looks a little different. So if I have this complex number, I want to write it in trig form. Well, I need two things. I need radius and I need angle. Well, how do I find the radius? It's the magnitude, yep. What do you do? Square root of 6 squared plus 6 squared. That's going to be the square root. Well, it'd be negative 6 squared, but yeah, when you square a negative, it flips to a positive. But you're right, that would be negative. Uh, what goes under the radical? 72. And then what does that simplify to? 6 root 2. So that's your radius. <coughs> what else do I need to find? The angle. How? Yeah, take rise over run. In other words, the complex portion over the, ma or the imaginary portion over the real portion. So that's negative 6 over 6 is your tangent. Now you don't need the calculator for this. That's just negative 1. When is tangent negative 1? Say again. Three pi over four. 
Would that work for this one? You want the greens? No, you want radiance for this. Would that work for this one? No. Why not? <laughs> because it's in the fourth quadrant. If I graph 6, negative 6, that's here. 3 pi over 4 is in the second quadrant. So what do I actually need? 7 pi over 4. Because the problem is, it's actually both answers, but only one of them works. So then to write it in trig form, I'm just going to put the radius out front. So this z uh, complex number is 6 root 2 times cosine, yep, 7 pi over 4. I'll typically put the i out front here just because if you put it after, sometimes it can look like it's in with the sign or like that it's part of the 7 pi over 4. So I'll usually put it there for when we're dealing with trig. So that would be your trig form. Okay. It looks a lot more complicated, but it allows us to do some stuff later. Now, questions on that one? Okay. So if I have the trig form here, and I want to change it to standard form, what would I do? This one's actually even easier. Yeah, just simplify it. What's cosine of 2 pi over 3? negative half. So what I have here is z equals 8 times negative 1 half plus what's sine 2 pi over 3? Square root of 3 over 2. I. Then what? Yeah, distribute the 8. You get what? Four square root of 3i. And you're done. Going from the trig to the standard is real easy. Just simplify it. Okay. Questions on those? All right. Now, the nice thing about this form is that what I can actually do with it, if I want to multiply together two of these complex numbers, what I can do instead, I can actually change them both to trig form. So if I have vectors z1 and z2, if they're in trig form and I multiply them, all I actually need to do is multiply the radii together, then take the inside the sine and cosine, just add the vectors, or add the angles, sorry. For division, you just divide the radii and subtract numerator minus denominator angles. So it allows you to do these fairly quickly when you have this trig format. Or if you're in complex form and want to convert. Um, so if I have this, I can't just put one over the other. I need to actually use that process where if I'm to want the product, so z1 times z2, well, I'm just going to multiply the radii. So what's that going to give me? 12. Then inside, actually I'll do that in the next line. So here if I do 3 times 4, that'll give me 12. Cosine then, I'm going to do what? Yeah. Pi over 3 plus pi over 6. What is pi over 3 plus pi over 6? Pi over 2. And the sine is going to do the exact same thing. So what is cosine of pi over 2? Zero. Zero. What's sine of pi over 2? So in other words, you have 12 times 0 plus i, 12i. So multiplying those two together just gives you 12i. OK. Questions on that one? Division works the same way, but instead of times and add, you <coughs> divide the radii and subtract the angles. Order matters here because since you're doing subtraction now, the radius in this case, both of them are just one. Yeah, so that's just gonna be one. What am I gonna have inside the cosine? Forty minus ten, so it'll give you thirty. Yep. And you'll solve the same thing for the sine.
What is cosine of 30? Square root of 3 over 2. Sine 30? So plus 1 half i. And that's your answer. Those aren't too bad. It is useful, but honestly, if you had them in the other form, you could just do it that way too. This does allow you to avoid having to deal with the conjugate, because if you had a plus bi over c plus di, you'd have to multiply by the conjugate and then foil the numerator as well, and then separate out the fraction. So we've done that kind of stuff before. This allows you to avoid that and just get you straight to the answer. Okay. Where it's very, very useful, though, is when you're talking about powers. Um, those in French might be able to say it better than I can. I have no idea what de moi or whatever. Anyway, de moi, de moi? Uh, well, if you say so, I'll believe you. Yeah. I don't care. So, <laughs> um, the idea, this is what, uh, if you would need to raise a complex number to a power, the trig form makes this very, very nice because all you have to do is take that radius and raise it to the power. And inside, all you do is multiply by whatever that power was for each of the angles. The reason that's powerful is because if I have something like this, to do this by hand would suck. 1 minus i to the 6th power. What does that actually mean? One plus i times 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 one plus i, so on and so forth. Okay, to do that all out and then deal with the fact that you have i to the sixth term, i to the fifth term, i to the fourth, i to the third, i to the, and deal with the fact that all those convert as well would take quite a while. By being able to change to trig form and use this theorem, you can do it much quicker. Because if I change this to trig form, well, first off, how would I? Ignoring the sixth power for the moment. Yeah, you find the radius first by taking the real component and the imaginary component, and you get the square root of two. two. Square root of two, right? Yeah. What's the other thing I need? The magnitude. That is the magnitude. Oh, okay. Theta, the angle. So tangent of theta is going to be equal to one over one. In other words, one. Well, when is tangent one? Pi over 4, 45 degrees, right? Yep, and first quadrants, they're both posi positive, so it will be pi over 4. If it was negative and negative, it would be 5 pi over 4. So now, what I'm going to do is write it as, if this was just what's inside, well, you'd have the square root of 2 out front, and then cosine pi over 4, plus i sine pi over 4. Now, but I want to take that and I want to raise it to the 6th power. So z to the 6 is going to take the square root of 2 and do what? Raise it to the 6th. And so then it would just be cosine times, or cosine 6 pi over 4. Yeah, it'll simplify out to 3 pi over 2. But the idea is I'm taking 6 times both of those. So that will be 3 pi over 2. What's the square root of 2 to the 6 going to give you? Well, change it if you need to. Square root of 2 is 2 raised to what power? The half. So this is 2 raised to the half raised to the 6. What do you do with exponents when you raise a power to a power? Multiply. So you get 2 to the what? Third. So that's 2 to the third which gives you 8. So you have 8 times, well what is cosine of 3 pi over 2? 0. What's sine of 3 pi over 2? Negative 1. So really what I have here is 8 times negative i, which is just negative 8i. So rather than raise that to 1 plus i times 1 plus i times 1 plus i, I'm multiplying it all out, all that distribution and foiling, you can just ch change it to trig and it gets you straight to the answer.
Say again. Well, considering the time crunch on some of you have on the test, I highly don't recommend it. And if it does say use De Mauvier or whatever, De Mar whatever his name is, theorem, you do need to do it this way. Okay? Just call him DM. DM. There we go. Okay. Slide in DM's theorem. So, now the reverse of that idea needs a little bit of modification. It's not bad when you take an angle and make it bigger. You don't have reoccursion. The fact that the theta repeats every two pi or every pi, depending, doesn't actually hurt you because you're extending it. You're making it larger. When you shrink it, you do need to compensate for that. So the reverse of this formula looks a little bit different because the things can reoccur more and more often. Okay. So what this says, if I want to find the nth root, so if I want to take the nth root of r, the radius is still the easy part. Just take the nth root of whatever that radius is. Now the cosine isn't just going to be theta though, and it's not just theta over n. You've got to do theta plus that 2 pi k to hit those repetitions and divide all of it by n. Okay. Now that k value is going to change based on what n is. However many times this thing repeats is going to be dependent on what n is. You're always going to want to do one less. So if you're doing the third root, because you're dividing by 3, you're making that thing occur that many times. So you need to do it when k is 0, when k is 1, and when k is 2. Whatever that n is, you do it that number of times. So you start with 0, then 1, 2 pi, 2, 2 pi, and 3, 2 pi, or whatever. You actually have to do the equation three times. Okay. So this is what that makes it a little bit complex. So if I want to find all the fourth roots of one, and this is the way it'll be phrased. Okay? Because how many fourth roots of one are there? Fourth root means there's four. Now, they may not all be real, because if it said square root, you get positive and negative one, right? You're going to run into more than that, though. So what I want to do is actually look at, since it says fourth root of one, so I'm taking the fourth root of one plus how many i's? Zero. So I can think of it that way. Now, first off, I want to define some of my variables here. Um, what's your n here? four because you're doing the fourth root. So n is four in this case as far as that formula goes. Um, what's r? One. What's theta? <coughs> Don't make that harder than it is guys. Where is the where is the point one zero i? One plus zero i? Yeah the angle would be zero. It's just one to the right. So your theta is just going to be zero. Okay? Now you can change it to trig form and do it that way, but you need that you need to know what the n is, you need to know what the radius is, and you need to know what theta is. Okay? From here, I'm gonna use that formula. I'm gonna do the fourth root of I just realized I don't have enough paper for this. Fourth root of one times cosine. Now here's the thing that's gonna change. It's gonna start at zero and then you're gonna add two pi k to it and divide by what? Four, and then you're gonna do the same thing with sine. Oops, put the i out front. Potentially, it does get fairly easy once you're used to it. Now the thing is, how many different k values do I need to do? Four, because it's the fourth root. So I'm gonna do what four numbers for k? Zero, one, two, three. Zero, one, two and three. So I'm going to do these four problems. But it actually doesn't end up being that bad because what's the fourth root of one? One. So that part I can basically ignore. So what this is saying is if I plug in zero, so I'm going to do these circumstances over here. So when k equals zero, okay, well, what's my numerator going to turn into? Zero. Zero over four is just zero. So I have cosine of zero plus i sine zero. 
Okay. Then do it for one. What do you get? Yeah, you're going to put in one for k, right? Zero plus two pi times one is just two pi. Two pi over four is what? Pi over two. And then do the same thing for two. If I plug in two here, what am I going to get? Pi. Pi. So cosine of pi. I actually leave myself some room. So when k is equal to two, I have cosine of pi plus i sine pi. And then if I plug in three, what am I going to get? Yeah, zero plus three pi, or plus six pi divided by four is just gives you six pi over four, so three pi over two. Nope. Nope. Because what's going to happen? I still need to simplify these. Cosine zero plus i sine zero. What's cosine of zero? What's sine of zero? Zero. So this thing's going to simplify to just be one. Here, what's cosine of pi over two? Sine pi over two? So this simplifies to be? I. Here, cosine of pi? Negative one, right? Sine of pi? So this simplifies to be? Negative one. Down here? Zero. Negative i, so negative i. So your four answers are 1 when k is 0, i when k is 1, negative 1 when k is 2, and negative i when k is 3. So you have those four answers. Is that problem done now? Now, the thing is, that's where they're being a little bit nice to you. Okay, they're giving you those values that are coming out to be zero for a lot of it, right? They're not always that nice. One more. Find the cube root of z equals negative six plus six i. So since it's cube root, n is what? <coughs> n is equal to three. Okay, you'll have three different answers. So what else do I need? Radius and theta. What's the radius going to be? Six squared of two. We did this problem earlier, right? Six squared of two. Now the thing is, which quadrant is negative six plus six i in? Two. So it's up here. So what's theta going to be? What is it? 3 pi over 4. Because you're splitting the quadrant exactly in half, because you're going the same left as you are up. Okay? Or you can also do tangent of theta equals negative 1, be 3 pi over 4. So here's what I'm going to use now. So from there, and if you want to, you don't have to plug it all into the equation right away. You can do some work separately with it. But I do need to deal with the fact that this cubed root is here first. And in this case, 6 root 2 might not be the best route to go. I would actually leave that as the square root of what? 72. Because the first thing I'm going to do with that is what? Cube, not cube it. Cube root it. Okay? So what this is saying is, the first thing I would do with this is take the cube root of the square root of 72. So what root is that actually? It's the sixth root. Because this means 72 raised to the 1 half, raised to the 1 third. What do you do when you raise the power to a power? Multiply. So same thing here. It's a sixth root of 72. I'm just going to leave it that way. OK? So now, if I take that part, I need to deal with the k. What are my values for k? 0, 1, and 2. So then I'm going to actually take what's inside the parentheses. So this thing's starting where again? We're for theta. 3 pi over 4. So I'm not going to deal with cosine or sine yet. I'm just going to deal with what's inside, the angle. 
So I'm starting at 3 pi over 4 plus 2 pi k divided by what? 3. So let's do that for all three circumstances. k equals 0. If k equals 0, what do I end up with? I'm careful. It's dividing by 3, right? So that's actually dividing by 3 over 1. So what that's doing, the 2 pi is gone. Yeah, you have 3 pi over 4 times 1 third pi over 4. 3 pi over 12, simplify down to pi over 4. So k equals 0, you have pi over 4 for that one. OK? k equals 1. Well, again, I have 3 pi over 4. That's going to be times what? Well, times 1 third. Now I'm also going to have the 2 pi, which is over 1, times 1 third. So if you want to look at it that way, distribute the 1 third. So I'm going to get pi over 4 plus what? It's just going to be 1 third times that, 2 pi over 3. Now the problem is I need to simplify that. Yep. So make a common denominator 12. This numerator is what? This is 3 pi over 12 plus 8 pi over 12 gives you 11 pi over 12. So when k is 1, you have 11 pi over 12. <laughs> Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay. One more. K equals 2. So I still have the 1 third. It's still times 3 pi over 4. But now this is what? 4 pi, Four pi over 1. Okay? So you, again, you still have pi over 4. But what's 4 pi t oh, times 1 third going to give you? 4 pi over 3. Common denominator is 12, so again I have 3 pi over 12. 16 pi over 12 for the 4 pi over 3. 19 pi over 12. Remember when I said working with fractions is important? So, now I have all the bits and pieces. I can write the actual statements. Okay? Say so we still got like 10 minutes. Okay. Which way? So you can see that part? Okay. Yeah, these problems take a little bit. I would not expect to see more than one of these on a test. Sweet. Good. But is that one going to be like big root? So, it probably won't be fifth root. You wouldn't expect to see it. Something crazy like that. True. So, I still need to put this all together. So I'm going to take the sixth root. Now, if I want exact, then that's going to be the sixth root of 72 times cosine of pi over 4. Which side do you want to see? I only have this much paper to left to work with here. OK, so sixth root of 72 cosine of pi over 4 plus i sine pi over 4. Then sixth root of 72. Cosine now of the other one, 11 pi over 12. And you would just write these out. Okay, now if you wanted the approximate, then you would actually have to distribute the square the 6 through to 72 through there. Would you have to simplify the cosine pi over 4 since you know that one? Arguably you could. You could rewrite that as the it would be the what square root of 2 over 2 plus i square root of 2 over 2. Um, square root of 2 is not really going to multiply times the 6 root of 72 very well. So I probably wouldn't bother. Um, plus I sine 19 pi over 12. Now, that's not too bad. Now, if you tried to graph that, the other one's actually a little better. But this would be the exact three solutions. Okay. Questions?
that's not going to go anywhere nice further than that. If you do, it does work. You actually end up getting, your answers would look like this. Yeah. So it's kind of an argue with that point, which version is better. If it says in standard form, you would need to do this. You would, because this is standard form, A plus BI. If it said trig form, that would be this one. Notice this one doesn't specify. So I would just leave it at, as this form for now. Yes? Do you leave 19 pi over 12 as 19 pi over 12? Yep, because it doesn't simplify. What about 7 pi over 12? What? Remember, you got to subtract 2 pi. So you'd have to subtract 24 pi over 12, not just one pi, which is what you were doing. Okay, so yeah, you're right. If it was past that, but the thing is, this by only doing 0, 1, and 2, you're never going to have one past that. That's what's stopping you from having to do an extra one that's unnecessary. Because you're doing that three times when it's cube root or whatever. Questions? Okay. The rest of the time is yours.